Hello and welcome to the Car Kirana channel. In today's video, we're going to be talking about Toyota's new A25A FKS or FXS in the hybrid models. This engine is a marvel of engineering. People look at it as just a good old four cylinder. It actually has so much advancements, it makes the old engines look like ancient technology. And since Toyota is putting this engine in almost every single model they have, and it's becoming widely popular, I figured you guys would enjoy some technical details on this engine, some of the new cool technology in this engine. But before we dig into this subject, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. If you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much for watching another one of my videos. And without further ado, let's dig right into it. Let's talk about a small overview of this engine before we get started. And you notice that I've taken some of the components out just to show you about a small overview. This engine, like I said, is called A25A or it's also called Toyota Dynamic Force. And this engine, the biggest achievement with this engine is it is an Atkinson cycle, even in the non-hybrid models. Now in hybrid models, like I've spoken about in a previous series on how hybrids work, the Atkinson cycle engines typically have low power, very efficient, but in the hybrids they have the help of the hybrid system. Now in this case, this guy is all alone. So the, the advancement in technology, and this is what's the big deal about this engine is, it is an Atkinson cycle, yet it makes sufficient power at the size and, and at this displacement. This engine comes in, in various sizes. In the US, the ones that are popular is the 2.5, which is this one, and also the 2.0. Continuing on this video, we're gonna carry a theme that I carry in, in my series, which is simple but complicated. I'm gonna try to keep things simple, but they're actually extremely complicated. So let's start talking about system by system on this engine, and then we'll take you in the aerial view. Let's start with the cooling system. In most non-hybrid cars, you know, it's a good old mechanical water pump, flows the coolant, there's a thermostat, car, uh, coolant warms up, thermostat opens, goes, cools in the radiator, comes back, goes to the heater, just very good old fashioned, work great, life's good. However, this engine, it took it to uh, a very extreme level. So, First of all, this engine does not have a mechanical water pump that's driven by the belt. It has a, an electric water pump. And that in itself gives so many possibilities for this engine because now the computer controls every little movement of that coolant. It can vary the speed of that pump whenever it needs it, slow it down when it doesn't. But on, that, that was not enough with this engine. They went another whole new level after that. So this engine has flow valves that control the flow of coolant. And the idea of this is to prioritize. Like, let's say in the, in the, in the middle of summer, it's 100 degrees outside, and you don't really need the heater. You don't need that coolant to go inside the car, heat up the heater core, come out. Well, some cars have that ability, but in this, in this car, it is prioritized. It can shut off the heater. It can prioritize where the coolant's going. For example, when you start it in the morning, it's not gonna send coolant to the heater core. It's not gonna send coolant to the transmission. It's only gonna focus on the engine so it can warm up that coolant before it starts sending it everywhere. And also it has a cooled EGR. We're gonna talk about the EGR in a little bit. So it has the ability with the use of these flow valves to prioritize, wait, where do I wanna heat up first? Or what do I wanna cool first? And based on that, it's gonna, it's gonna send the coolant in different directions. The bottom line of this is, and this sounds too complicated, but what does it benefit the owner of the car? Well, these engines warm up extremely rapidly and the emission levels are very low and you get an insane gas mileage given the performance of this engine. Now it's no race engine, of course, not a very fast engine. It doesn't create big horsepower figures, but for what's intended use is actually a very nice engine to drive, has plenty of power. 
it's very efficient and it gets crazy gas mileage because of this is one of the reasons is this cooling system. It also has one more thing that you might read about and wonder. It has a heated thermostat and this is not a first for this engine. This was also used on the updated 3.5 V6 but a heated thermostat let me explain it in simple terms because it's it doesn't make sense initially but bear with me. So the whole idea of thermostat is to warm up the coolant faster but it has a heater that when it's turned on it opens that thermostat essentially. Well the idea of that is they discovered that when the engine is very cold and all of a sudden you floor the gas pedal and you're demanding high load from the engine, parts of the engine will warm up too fast and now you have something called pinging or knocking. That reduces emissions, that increases emissions, sorry, and reduce efficiency. So when you, when in certain conditions, and it, it's written in the text as high load when the engine is cold, so if you floor it when it's cold, it's gonna heat up the thermostat, open it to create coolant flow inside the engine, to cool those certain parts of the engine, to keep everything efficient, keep the emissions low, keep everybody happy. So that's the reason for that heated thermostat. Well, let's talk about the oiling system in this engine and this is uh, one that I want you to pay close attention if you own one of these engines. The first thing you notice about this engine oil wise is that it uses 0W16 and people have described it as water for oil. People have described it as the biggest disaster that's going to hit this engine. Bear with me when I say you are wrong if you think that way. And here's why. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not use any other oil than 0W16 in this engine. Yes, the owner's manual will tell you, you can substitute for 0W20, but it also tells you at the next oil change, go back to 0W16. That means you do not want to use that any other oil other than 0W16 weight in this engine long term. And the reason for that is, most older gasoline engines in Toyota land, it just uses a good old mechanical oil pump, spins with the engine, you rev up the engine, oil pressure goes up, you let the RPM come down, oil pressure comes down, when the oil is cold, it's higher pressure, warm warms up, lower pressure, has an oil, uh, oil pressure relief valve, so if the pressure all of a sudden shoots through the sky, it can relieve that pressure and kind of control it on the high end only. Come this engine. This engine does not have that exact basic ancient integrated system. It uses a variable oil pump. Now, it's a lot more complicated than what I'm going to make it right now, but in an essence, this engine has the ability to control the oil pressure very precisely. So hypothetical numbers here, where these are not exact numbers, I'm just giving you the idea so it, you can draw that picture. You start the engine cold, let's say the pressure is at 30 psi. The, the engine computer is watching everything. It does so much in this car, it's just marvel of engineering. It's watching everything. Okay, the engine is cold, let's put it at 30 psi. Engine warmed up, let's drop it to 10 psi. Then, you're driving normally, all I need to keep this engine lubricated and good is 10 psi. We're gonna keep it there, regardless of the RPM. Then all of a sudden you get to a certain amount of RPM, which from field testing, and this is not an official number, right around 2-3,000 RPM, the oil pressure jumps up. Let's say it was a 10, all of a sudden it went to 40, and it stays there, exact number, it doesn't even vary from that. This is the beauty of this engine, and the reason they did all this, and it just makes, makes people wonder, why all this complication? It sounds like a German car, not a Toyota. Well, the reason they did that is, you have that oil pump speeding up and down with the engine, creating all that friction and all that load on the engine. It's just like you have an AC compressor running. It, it actually creates a lot of load on this engine. But by doing that, where it's only going to use how much it needs, not how much the RPM demands, it's actually going to create less friction, therefore less emissions and better fuel efficiency. That's just a beauty of this system. And because of this beauty, 
you have to use the right oil because this system is calibrated to run on that specific oil. Toyota engineers, God bless them because they are very smart. Now, yes, they designed fail safes and they designed everything, but they cannot go out of their way to design things for misuse. They're gonna make things reliable and robust, but you misuse them by using, uh, say, 20W40, this whole theory goes out of the window and now you're on your own there because that's misuse, that is not, uh, you know, expectation that, oh, it's a Toyota, it's a reliable. That's not a good idea. Just use the 0W16 and trust me on this. I've already taken one of these engines apart and we've seen issues with oils. So stick with that 0W16 and you won't have problems. This engine is designed for that oil from the get-go. It was not an add-on like some others that changed to 0W20. Let's talk about the fuel injection in this car and uh, also not a exclusive new to this engine, but let me talk about it. This, this engine uses D4S direct injection system from Toyota. Now, people always wonder and ask this question and justifiably so. If you search the internet and direct injection, eh, horror stories. Well, direct injection, Direct injected engines, they have carbon problems. And the reason for that is direct injection, the injectors spray fuel directly inside on top, basically on the piston. It, engines run better like that, more efficiently. However, there is a secondary benefit to having the injectors not spray inside the cylinder but spray it in the intake, that's called port injection, which is like most non-direct injection injected cars, if you would. They spray inside the intake, so that fuel comes down at the back of the valve and then goes inside the combustion chamber to, to do everything else. When it passes at the back of the valve, it cleans it, it washes all the stuff off of it as it passes through it. Direct injection engines, does not have that benefit because the fuel never passes over the valve, it's sprayed directly in the, in the combustion chamber. So Toyota is probably the latest company, at least in the Toyota lineup, to introduce direct injection. And the reason for that is they, they had to make it reliable and they kept thinking and thinking and I can imagine the huge meetings and the R&D and all the thinking that they did. They came up with an ingenious idea, and I think you cannot possibly make it better, at least in my humble opinion. So this engine, ladies and gentlemen, is a four-cylinder, so it uses, co common sense would say, four injectors. No, this engine uses eight injectors, four direct injectors and four port injectors which is a genius idea. Essentially, yes, you have direct injection and you get all the benefits of the efficiency, but also you have port injectors, so now you don't have the carving up problems. And it, they even take it a step further than that, because they're not gonna just put a safety net for carbon. No, there are times when the engine is running, it is actually more efficient to put port injectors than direct. So now, again, the computer have infinite control over this. When it feels like it, it's gonna run port, Wait, we need direct injector. It's gonna start using direct injection and there are times actually you'll use both. It's pretty, pretty insane how, how that works and how reliable this is. And, and remember, this is a Toyota. This is not some high-end German car where reliability is the last thing on their mind. This engine is in a Toyota and it's this complicated and you know, 10, 15 years from now, we'll still be saying how amazing this is, how complicated it is, but how reliable it is. That's just the coolest thing with Toyota. They really engineer their stuff right. And because of that D4S system, there are two additional components that your typical non-direct injection cars have. We have two fuel pumps, one in the fuel tank, just a good old fuel pump in the fuel tank. We also have a high pressure fuel pump. Now, this fuel pump is a, a common offender. This brings more people to the dealership than anything else. Oh my God, I just bought this car and it sounds like a diesel. This fuel pump 
is the reason for that. That's why direct injected cars, they sound like clattery, they sound like a diesel. The pump and the injectors are extremely loud. That's just the way they are. But what brings people in the dealership all the time complaining about this is, it's making the sound and then all of a sudden, boom, it's gone. Look, it's nice and quiet. Well, that's because the computer switched from direct injection to port injection. And now the fuel pump is not doing anything and the injectors are off. So all of a sudden the car quiets down. That's why you notice it, even when it switches, you can feel it. Like at idle, you're sitting in the car, it's quiet, all of a sudden it gets super loud and you feel that variation. When it switches, you're gonna feel the switch and you're gonna hear it as well. Now, this fuel pump, relatively simple but very complicated of course like everything else it's computer controlled it can control the pressure this guy pressurizes fuel 3000 psi so it's really high pressure servicing the system needs some special care as well it has a metal pipe that goes from this fuel pump all the way to the injectors and in the aerial view i'll show you and the other component that the system have is a vacuum pump now in direct injection cars there's not enough vacuum creation in the intake to support the brake booster for your power brakes. So they have a little vacuum pump, runs off the camshaft, very simple, there's not much really much to it, it's just a little vacuum pump, goes directly to the brake booster, because remember this engine can have direct, non-direct, and it flips back and forth, so that's why they have a vacuum pump. Let's talk about the EGR system. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, EGR is back on non-hybrid cars. We all uh, have a love-hate uh, relationship with EGR systems because they are can be problematic, but it's back. And uh, they did say that there are some improvements. I don't know, we'll find out. But the idea here is, if you look at the exhaust manifold, and unfortunately I can't really take this off to show you, there's not four pipes that come out of the engine, there's five, because the fifth one is actually coming back. So it picks the gas, that's what EGR means, exhaust gas recirculation, essentially in a, in a two second uh, explanation, it takes exhaust gases, recirculates them back in the engine to get burned for emissions, essentially, that's the bottom line of that. So it takes, it picks up the gases after the catalytic converter to help it not be so contaminated, brings it back through the cylinder head, it also uses that to warm up the cylinder head, and then passes through a cooler, that cooler is also coolant cooled, and has that priority as well when we talked about the cooling system, and then goes through the exhaust, through the EGR valve, into the intake, and gets burned away like that. I will show you all these parts later, so that's the EGR, it's very similar to say a third generation Prius and I know if there's somebody watching this with a third generation Prius they have uh, some EGR problems but I hope this one will be more reliable with some uh, improvements. So I'm going to wrap this video right here for part one. In part two we're going to continue talking about other components of this engine. We're also going to take you on the aerial view, so stay tuned for that. Make sure you're subscribed, your notifications are turned on, so you wouldn't miss that video when it comes out. Until then, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and you have a wonderful day.